If you've got your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 4. If you've got your Bibles this morning, we, we're going to have a different translation, which you may not have brought this morning. And uh, I love kind of reading out of a different translation now and again, because for some of those who may have been in church for a while, it can help us to just re-engage a little bit with Scripture, especially ones that maybe we've heard before as well. And this is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. It's going to be on the screen from the message translation. It says this. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, you, and he's talking to the church, he says, you were all called to travel on the same road and in the same direction, so stay together, both outwardly and inwardly. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is to be permeated with oneness. Amazing passage of scripture. You, the church, he goes, I want you to know something. It's like Paul's been, if you go through Paul's letters to the church, to believers, it's like he's on this mission of togetherness. It's like the church is formed and then Paul's on this, this mission all the way through the gospel, or through, through the epistles and the, and the New Testament about the power of together. And he says, I want you to know this, that as believers, this is what we're called to do. We are all called to travel, he says, on the same road and we're to go in the same direction. And so if we're to go on the same road in the same direction, we need to stay together. And that's exactly what I want to preach to you this morning. I want to preach to you on the topic, the power of together, the power of together. Now, 2020, uh, how many of you know, has been quite an interesting year so far? Uh, I'm not sure if anyone in their list of goals for 2020 would have listed any of the things that have happened this year so far. If you did, good on you. Uh, but I certainly didn't. Uh, it's been interesting on a lot of levels. We don't need to go all through it again. But I would say one of the most interesting facets of 2020 uh, would have to have been the change in vocabulary we've probably all experienced. There's been words that I didn't even knew existed that I've now begun to use, and I'm sure you have as well. In our culture, they've just become part of who we are. Uh, we say them now because they're just... They're present there all the time. We say words like COVID. We say words like pandemic. We say words like lockdown. And I, I think one of the first words we got introduced to back in March, if we hadn't already heard it, uh, was that word social distancing. Social distancing. I must admit, when I first heard that word, there was something in me that didn't like that word. Social distancing. Still don't, yes. Uh, and here's the thing. I, I knew medically while they were saying that word, right? Because of the virus and because there was a pandemic and that people needed to be physically separate. But let me say this. While we may have to be physically separate, we should never be socially distant. Because in the middle of the crisis, the thing that you need the most are relationships. When everything's going pear-shaped in your world, the thing that you need above everything else is actually people. And relationships actually are the very thing that keeps us safe. Relationships is what keeps us strong. It's relationships that keep us healthy. And it's relationships that keep us encouraged in life. Because you and I, we were not meant to do life alone. You and I were meant to, designed by God, to do life in relationships. Did you know that the first problem that we find in the Bible that God addresses is not sin? You know, I think some of us have this idea that we see God created man, man sinned, therefore sin's the first problem. Actually, it's not. The first problem that God addresses in the Bible is not sin, it's solitude. God creates Adam in his likeness and his image, states that it's very good what he's created, but then he sees that there's something that's missing. And he makes this declaration in the book of Genesis and says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. God creates Adam, but then he realizes that there's something very valuable, vital, that's missing from his life, relationships. Because God recognizes that without relationships, that man 
is in a vulnerable place. And so God, first of all, addresses the greatest problem that you and I can experience in life, which is isolation or separation. And so what God does, the Bible says God creates Eve. God creates what he's doing here. He's creating this sense of community or relationships around mankind because he's saying this to us. We need each other. That we can't do life alone. You know, uh, back in 2018, so this is pre-COVID, the Sunday Mail did an article that was front page and then went into the next two pages. It was called Only the Lonely. And it was about what they termed, this was the article, a pandemic or an epidemic of loneliness. This is the quote. Australia, it says, is in the midst of a loneliness epidemic that is so bad it's making people sick and even causing premature deaths. Top medical experts say this loneliness crisis has been brought on by technology, the increasing number of people living alone in Australia, social isolation, family breakdowns, and the loss of neighborhood connection and community gatherings, such as attending church. Research study said this, 25% of Australians often or always feel lonely. 30% or nearly one in every three Australians said they were not currently part of a strong group of friends. 55% of Australians said they often feel like they lack companionship and friendship in their life. The studies they cited about loneliness and isolation, basically summing up this way, found that where there's isolation, where there's loneliness, everything bad goes up. So studies showed that where there was loneliness or isolation, it's associated with an increase in mental health issues, anxiety, depression, suicide, alcohol consumption, blood pressure, higher cholesterol levels, and the, it can increase the chances of early death by 26%. And here's why. Because God knew it from the very beginning. We were created for relationship. And when we find ourselves isolated, it can bring despair into our life. Now, I like that the article actually tried to point towards a solution. It said the top medical experts are calling on the government to create a new government department, a ministry for loneliness. Now, while I applaud the government wanting to do something, can I just say this? The answer is not another government department in Canberra. The answer, I believe, God's answer is right here. It's called the church. Because as the church, we exist, I believe, to help address the greatest need of mankind, the need for relationship with God through his son Jesus, and the need for relationship and community with one another. It's called the church. You and I are designed to call to be not just part of relationship and community, but designed and called to bring others into that place as well. Because church from the very beginning was always built on this revelation of our togetherness in Christ. It's the power of together. That was always God's plan for the church. It was always God's plan for the body of Christ. It was a revelation that you and I were now together or united in Christ. And what that means is God's plan for our life is that we would do life together. As the Apostle Paul said, we'd realize that God would have us walking in the same direction, going down the same road. And one of the greatest things that we can do in our life is make a decision that we're not going to do it alone. We're going to do it together with other people. You know, this was the biblical model for the church. The early church started. Two things happened. The Bible says the Holy Spirit was poured out. That's why we always make room in our church for the Holy Spirit here. Because we know that the church is built on the infilling of the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer to empower us to live a life of godliness and service to God. We get filled with the Holy Spirit, but then after that, it says two things began to happen in this early church. Number one, there was temple worship. So every week, the believers would gather together in this place called the temple, and they would come to worship God, they would come to celebrate God, they would come to gather together, they would come to hear the Word of God preached. And that big environment was awesome. But church was more than just that big environment. It says that they would also have house-to-house -house gatherings. In other words, they gathered in smaller groups from house to house. It said they would have meals together. They would pray together. They would care for one another. They would love for one another. So the picture is this. The church was formed on this revelation that people had of their togetherness in Christ. Life together is God's best plan for us. And that's why I'm so excited that we're launching a new term of groups today. 
And it's so awesome that our, I love it, that our directory of groups is the biggest it's ever been. We have 71 different groups today. Come on, let's, let's celebrate that. That's awesome. And you've seen some of the diversity of, of some of those groups. All in the way. I kind of think if there's 71 groups, there's probably one that's going to work for me somewhere in that mix. And I love it. And you know what? There's, there's all kinds of different groups. I was out there before in the cafe and just checking out some of the, the different types of groups. We've got equip groups about how to, how to buy your first home. We did one of these earlier in the year. It was packed out. And we had practical strategies there from, from people who work in the field about how to plan and achieve the goal of buying a house and setting yourself up. I love, I saw one out there before. It's called Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. And it's about a bunch of dinner parties coming together to just to, just to bring some joy maybe into relationships and learn a bit more about, about how to do life together in marriage. I know there's a bushwalking group. I can see our bushwalking leaders here this morning, Ray and Karen. Who loves Ray and Karen Curley this morning? They do a great job. They go for hikes. Ray knows how to go for runs. If you ever met Ray, we... Spitty Gonzalez goes for a lot, but this one's just a bush hike, and you can go and they explore the great southeast, and then these guys know hospitality people. I've been over there before. It's not a bush hike unless you finish with a cook-up at the end of it normally, and that's, uh, that's one of the great things about it. We also have got bouldering groups, that's indoor rock climbing, creative workshops. Can you believe it? They've got Christmas decoration workshops. We've got groups for young mums called Wednesday Morning Mockers, I saw before. It's run by Rachel Shafarius. We've got games groups and... One of my favorite groups, he's actually our legend on sound this morning. His name is Brad Pinder. Can we give it up for Brad this morning? Do you love Brad? We had a little video Brad posted through the week. He's been running this group for ages. It's a, it's a men's group. They gather together. It's just fireside chats with the guys. And they get together. And I know it was about getting fire, but just seemingly fire seems to just make that thing happen. And they talk about life. They talk about the Bible. They talk, pray for one another, encourage one another, and just learn about doing life together. And listen, but listen, I want to hear this today. We, we believe that there should be a diversity of groups because there's a diversity of people. And that this, just having a, a narrow view of what a group may look like is, is not the best way to connect people. But listen, let me say this. I love the variety of groups, and I, I'm praying today that one of those activities or one of the curriculum really jumps out at you and you say, yes, that's why I want to be involved. But can I say this? The best part of groups is not the activity or the curriculum, the best part of groups are the relationships. And our prayer is that you would go to a group, yes, because you're interested maybe in what they're doing, but our prayer is that you would go to that group, but you would meet people in that church, in that group where you could say, you know what, I want to do life with some people here. Let, let's walk on that same road, that same journey together. Let's find ourselves in a place where we're not isolated or alone, but we're surrounded. And that's our vision here at C3. You know, this morning we have about uh, 15 people who are out this morning doing this thing called the growth track, where we tell people about what the vision steps are for every person. There's four vision steps. The first one is to make C3 your home, because we believe that church should not just be something you come to, it should be a home. It should feel like family. It should feel like a place that you belong. The second step is a step that's called get connected, because we know that there is power when you and I understand that God's called us to do life Together, God does not want any person isolated or feeling alone in relationships, but actually the purpose is that you would not be isolated, but you would be surrounded, that you would be surrounded in your life with people that know you and care for you and where you also know and care for others as well. And our desire is this, that you know what, we might be a big church, but I pray that we'd never be a church where people just come to a service and then go. Because I tell you this, everything we do Everything we value as a church is all about relationships, helping people to grow in their relationship with God and helping people to grow in their relationships with others. It's called the power of together. I love what the Apostle Paul says. He says, you, that's you and I, we're called to travel on the same road in the same direction, so stay together. This morning... I want to give you, just in the time we've got left, I want to give you what I believe is the single most important reason that Scripture tells us that we should embrace the power of together. That I want to give you this morning what I believe is the single most important why about you and I gathering together in relationships, both here on Sunday, but also in groups and in our homes as well. And here it is this morning. Here is the reason that Scripture tells us 
and places such a high value on gathering together. It's one word. It's called encouragement. Encouragement. Wherever you go, in the New Testament particularly, and you see a, a, a scripture which is uh, talking about the church gathering together and the importance of gathering together, pretty sure after that, you'll see this word called encouragement. Because here's what happens. God uses people to bring encouragement into our life. God uses people to bring encouragement into our life. Now listen, why is that so important? Well, I think it's always important to have encouragement, but I don't think there's ever really been a time, at least probably for most of us in our lifetime, where there's more people that are facing discouragement on so many levels. I mean, for all of us, there's, there's always seasons and times in our life because of things we walk through where we will face discouragement. I think what 2020 has done, what COVID has done, has just amped that up to a whole other level because of the pressures and things that we face. And so many, are, so many people are in this battle constantly with discouragement. And why it's so important that we address discouragement is that, you know what, discouragement, if left unchecked, can easily become despair in our life. But God doesn't want any of us to live in that place of discouragement. You know, um, I know there's a whole range of very serious things that are happening across the world and different people's lives. But you know what? I think COVID and discouragement has hit people on you know, a whole range of different levels. I was just talking a couple of weeks ago. I had a Zoom call with some pastors in Canberra. Great people. Really lovely people. And we were just talking about 2020. And uh, they were talking about the fact that it was their anniversaries. I think it was their 25th wedding anniversary. And they were sharing with me. They were saying, hey, uh, actually... This, we were designed, we were, we were kind of uh, booked in to have an overseas holiday to celebrate our 25th anniversary. We're going to be in Europe right now. In fact, he was talking to me, he said, I was going to be in Barcelona this weekend watching my favorite team, which was Barcelona, I think, in the soccer. I had tickets to go. I was going to go to the Grand Prix after that. And he said, you know what? Instead of being in Europe for a celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary, we're going to Queanbeyan. <laughs> I... But we laughed. We were like, yeah, isn't that hilarious? Europe, Queen, you know. But there was a sense of kind of, there was a little bit of discouragement there too. It was like, oh, you know, dreams that are dashed. Things that have happened unexpectedly that, that, that have just, that can change people and change their emotional and mental outlook in so many ways. One of the greatest reasons God wants us as believers as the church to gather together is what he calls mutual encouragement. In other words, one of the primary reasons in Scripture that we see for the church to gather together is so that you and I can fight discouragement in our lives. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 23, this is what Paul says. He says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Listen to this. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. Check this out but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day, of, um, the day approaching. He's saying in the face of discouragement, he talks about holding unswervingly to some things. I love that word, hold unswervingly. Don't, don't let go of these things. You know what he says? Hold unswervingly to hope. You know what? We need to hold on to hope to overcome discouragement in life. We have to remember it's not about what we put our hope in, but who we put our hope in. Our hope is not in government. Our hope is not in an ideology. Our hope is not in another person. It says our hope is in the name of the Lord. Our hope is a person and his name is Jesus. Then it says, not just hold on to hope, but hold unswervingly to God's faithfulness. He says, for he who makes these promises in Scripture, he is faithful. He's faithful. You know, sometimes you might hear me say things like, or preachers up here say, don't look back to the past. There's truth in that, but also there is a time to look back to the past. Not to look back on mistakes or not to look back with regret, but actually, for those of us who are believers, it is good to look back in the past to recognize the faithfulness of God. You know what? When you're walking through something in your life and you're feeling discouraged, you're feeling, I don't know how to get through this, to look back and say, actually, you know what, God? I remember this time in my life. We were, we were on our bare bones. We had nothing, but God, you provided. I remember when my family was going through this season, it all seemed like a mess, 
But God, you came through and you somehow restored things back there. God, I remember when I was sick and I was battling in this thing, but God, you brought healing into my life. It says, don't let go. Hold unswervingly to the hope you profess because he who promised you is faithful. He says, don't let go of that. God is faithful. We need to remind ourselves, God's got this. He's going to take care of it. He's going to bring you through it because I put my hope in him. And I know he's going to show himself faithful. Then it says, hold unswervingly to this too, to loving others. It says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. You know the greatest way to get, us, get our mind off discouragement? One of the best ways? Just start to focus on other people. The Bible says, think about not your own issues, but just think about how you can encourage someone else, how you can spur someone else on. How, you know, and I find this, the simplest acts of encouragement can be the greatest things in someone else's world. That text you send, that meal you bring, that, that encouraging word that you bring into their life. Those things, it says, let us hold unswervingly to that. And here's the last thing he says, hold unswervingly to the habit of gathering together. He says, don't give up meeting together. He goes, some people have done that and it's been to their detriment. You know, here's what I find. Uh, our relationship with God and our own is, is a very, very important part of our world. And, and, and there is so much that you and I can access via technology. I love it. There's, we, can, we can listen to podcasts. We can watch services. We can do all these things. It's awesome. But listen, Scripture is clear. There are some things we can only receive from God when we gather together. The presence of God, the atmosphere of faith, community, mutual encouragement. Jesus says, where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Jesus is saying, my presence is going to show up when you and I gather together. It says, don't give up meeting together. In other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying, make it an essential part of your Christian life to gather together regularly. Why? He says, don't give up meeting together. Why? Because we can encourage one another. You know, um, about two years ago, I left church one day after a morning service. I went home, I took my iPad, I took my Bible, I went back home. Later on that day, I opened up my Bible and there was a little letter tucked in the front. I was like, oh, where'd that come from? I opened up the letter and there was this, um, like, you know, the old, old school kind of um, handwriting paper they used to do when they wrote letters? And there was this beautiful cursive writing and it was three pages and someone had written me a letter and put it in the front of my Bible, and I realized it was a lady who was in our prime area. Beautiful lady, served God her whole life. Great encourager, great person. Wrote this letter. You know in this letter it says, Dear Andrew, I've been thinking about you, just praying for you. I want to share with you some scriptures that God put on my heart. She wrote the scriptures out. I want to share with you just some things I think you're, you're walking through in your life and how God's going to help. She wrote those things out. And then she said, Here's some things I see in your future. And she wrote those things out. You know, when I opened that up, and I don't even remember what it was now. But I, I, I knew at that time there was a couple of battles going on in my world. But as I opened that up, it was seriously like the Holy Spirit had just penned this letter through this lady who had no idea what I was going through, but, but inspired her heart to encourage me. Do you know, when you would know this, that letter sits in the drawer beside my bed. I open it up because it's one of the most encouraging, life-giving things wow, wow. over my world. You know what? When God wants to bring encouragement into your life, most of the time, he'll use a person. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians. I have the highest confidence in you, and I take great pride in you. This is the Apostle Paul. You have greatly encouraged me and made me happy despite all our troubles. When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction. This is where a lot of people feel like they're at today. With battles on the outside and fear on the inside. I love this. But God. Come on. You're facing some battles? Facing some fear? But God. But God who encourages those who are discouraged. Encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. In other words, God brought a person by the name of Titus into the life of the Apostle Paul at a time when he was feeling discouraged in a time when he was facing battles with the express agenda of lifting Paul from out of his discouragement and filling him with new faith, hope, and confidence for his future. God sent a miracle into the apostle Paul's life, but he wrapped that miracle in the form of a person by the name of Titus. 
I love how God here sends encouragement, but he does it in the form of a person. I don't just believe that's for the Apostle Paul. I believe that's how God works in your life and my life as well. Some of you have been praying, God, help me in this area of my life. God, give me wisdom here. Give me answers here. But maybe you haven't considered that God's answer that he's sending you is going to come wrapped in the form of a person. And we can easily overlook relationships. You know, a few years back now, when Wendy and I were dating, so about five years ago, (laughs) maybe a little bit longer, hey, babe. We had a, uh, when we were dating, we had a, uh, an overseas relationship, a long distance relationship. Wendy lived in Germany. Uh, she worked over there for a company called Adidas at the head office, and I was a primary school teacher at the time. And uh, anyway, I was uh, teaching my class that day, and uh, uh, midway through the day, a knock on the door came, and someone said, there's a brown box here for you, sir. And I was like, yeah, all right. Put it over there in the corner. It's just a brown box. That's all it was. So anyway, put it over there in the corner. I ignored it. And the truth was, the reason I ignored it it's a brown box. Like, probably had papers in there for me to mark or something. I don't know. I'll ignore those for later on. And so I put that over in the corner. I was like, I just ignored it because the packaging, the packaging was ordinary. It was just ordinary. You know what? End of the day, uh, once all the kids had gone, I went over and I opened up that brown box and I realized that it had been sent from Germany, from Wendy. Uh, and inside that box, which was about this high, when I opened it up, It was filled with all of this brand new gear from Adidas, including roughly about 20 pairs of Adidas shoes, about a dozen rugby jerseys. Uh, There were shorts, socks, everything, all sizes, all colors, everything. And it was, you know, to to both, you know, give me some some treats that I could wear, but also to to give out to all the kids in our school too. How many of you know that uh, Mr. McGruder became a very popular teacher very quickly (laughs) in that moment? Thank you, Wendy. But let me make this point. I didn't pay any attention. I disregarded the box because of the packaging on the outside. It just looked, it looked ordinary. But here's what I discovered. When I opened up that box and I looked inside, that is when I saw the value. That's actually when I realized that there was treasure in there. Do you know the Bible says this about human beings? It says that God puts his treasure in jars of clay. What is that treasure? It's his spirit. But where does he put his spirit? In a jar of clay. In packaging that looks quite ordinary. Packaging that looks quite insignificant. I find we do exactly the same thing like I did with that box, sometimes with relationships. Sometimes because perhaps the packaging looks a bit run-of-the-mill. That we can miss that actually when we open up that box and we look inside and we invest in that relationship that actually God's treasure is there. The gift of God that he wants to bring into my life. The gifts of of hope, of strength, encouragement, of life, of, of joy. They come wrapped in a person. And God wants to bring a miracle into your life, many times he'll bring it in the form of a person. I can't tell you, well, I could tell you, but we're here all day, about how many people here in the life of our church over the last 20 plus years that I've been here have been like God's provision in my life. Encouragement, wisdom, strength. God brought a miracle into my life, but he wrapped it in the form of a person. And that's what I discovered with relationships is maybe for some of us, maybe that answer that we seek, maybe that help that we need, maybe that wisdom that we are asking God for, He's sending it or He's sending it into our world, but it's in the form of a person who wants to bring God, who says He wants to bring encouragement to those who feel like they're discouraged. You know what? Never dismiss the power that God has to use relationships in your life and my life. Maybe you're feeling low. Maybe you're feeling discouraged. How do you fight it? You fight it by gathering together. You know, the enemy hates together. God has an assignment that he would see you and I gather together. The enemy has an assignment as well. 
God wants us together. The enemy wants to divide. He wants to separate. He wants to isolate. Because he knows that things change when we pray together. He knows that God's presence is there when we gather together. He knows that miracles can happen when we agree together. The enemy's agenda is to isolate you, but God's plan is to bring you together. And just as we close this morning, you know, we can know that, but one of the things that I find, or a couple of things that I find can stop us or prevent us from embracing the power of together in our life. In fact, I think there's two things. The first one I call past hurts. You know, one of the reasons that we can stop embracing relationships and community is, is it maybe because of things that have happened in life, there's, there's been some past hurt. You know, in the book of Luke, Jesus says, he says, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel. Then the next thing Jesus said, he says, I've come to heal the brokenhearted. Why would Jesus say that? Because he knows that hearts are fragile things. And, and you might say, well, you know what? I'm not brokenhearted. I think most people would probably say, this morning, I don't feel like I'm brokenhearted. Like some people can be. You can go through divorce. You can go, and, 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 and hearts can get broken. But you know, in, in the translation of that word broken, it also means bruised. Jesus has come to heal hearts that have got some bruises. They've got some bruises. You know, I, uh, I used to play a little bit of rugby in my time. It would be a pretty silly idea for me or anyone else on our team to go and play a game of rugby and expect that at the end of that game that no one would have a bruise. Like, you just come to expect it, don't you? Like, you play rugby, you finish a game of sport, it's like there's people coming together, there's contact, you're gonna walk away with a bruise. It's gonna happen. But sometimes I think in life, in relationships, sometimes even in church, we can get surprised that we may get a bruise. But that's what will happen in relationships. You know, in the, in the New Testament, we see this, this thing continually. It's like, love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another. But you know what then it says after that? Forgive one another, forgive one another, forgive one another, forgive one another. It's because they both go hand in hand. You can't love and embrace relationships and not cop a few bruises along the way. That's why God says, we've got to love one another, but then be prepared that you're going to cop a couple of bruises along the way. So forgive one another, forgive one another, forgive one another. Keep doing it. And here's what I've discovered. Getting bruised is automatic, but carrying hurt is optional. You know, in, in life, if I get a bruise naturally, if I just leave it long enough, it should heal up. But the bruises of our heart don't work like that. We can carry the hurt of that thing for many times, for many, for many seasons of life. And what happens is when we get a bruise, sometimes instead of letting Jesus get in there and heal that thing and giving the Holy Spirit access into our life, what we do is we, we become self-protective. So we don't want to get bruised again. You know what happens if you get a cop of bruise on your leg? Isn't it amazing how people can seemingly find that bruise really quickly? <laughs> like children, oh, you got that bruise. Oh my God, one bruise on my leg, you found it. But what we do is the same. We, we can just withdraw back. And we go, you know, we might have relationships in our life, but we know we've pulled back. And the reason we pull back is to protect ourselves. But actually, we may be protecting ourselves, but also at the same note, we can be robbing ourselves of the very provision and power and strength that God wants to bring in our life through those relationships. That's why Jesus says, I'll come to heal the broken heart. He's like, if you've got a bruise, if you've got a hurt, just bring it to me. Because only Jesus can heal those bruises. And only Jesus can make our hearts ready and alive in that place for those relationships. Past hurts. Here's the other thing that stops us, I think, from embracing the power of together, and that's getting planted getting planted. Psalm 92 verse 13 says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. You know what? God's plan for you and I, it says here, it's to flourish. God's plan is to make you thrive. He wants to bless you. Come on, church. This, this is God's plan. But you know what? There's a precondition to that plan. It says, I will flourish and bless and I will cause those to thrive who are planted. Plant yourself in the house of God. And God will take care of the flourishing. You know, I was talking to someone just uh, the other week. Uh, I love jacaranda trees. Anyone else love jacaranda trees? I don't know if you noticed the one out here that's just kind of starting to flower. I love the tree. It's a great tree. And, uh, but I love seeing the picture when it's flourishing, when it's, when it's thriving. It's a great picture we see in Scripture all the time, that idea of, of flourishing in life. I was talking to someone who helped plant that thing like plus 20 years ago. Amazing. 
But you know what? I could take three or four of the, the biggest, strongest blokes, you know, that are here in this room this morning. I'll look around. Like John Wiggins, of course. And Tony and Roswell. Let's say, let's over there. And, uh, and a few of the guys. And perhaps EJ Latu over there as well. He's, he's got some size on him too and some strength. We could go outside and all four of us, we could, we could get that jacaranda tree and we could push against that trunk as hard as we possibly could. I can guarantee you would never knock that thing over. Do you know why? The strength of that tree is not in the timber, not in the piece of wood. The strength of that tree is in its root system. 20 years of being planted. That root system is what causes that, that tree out there to thrive and prosper through drought, uh, through storm, through adversity, through every... It, it's thriving and flourishing because it's, it's planted. The root system of our life that causes us to be planted, the root system is our relationships. It's our relationships that sustain us. It's our relationships that strengthen us. And it's our relationships then that become those supply lines of God into our life that will cause us to flourish and to thrive. Can I encourage you? Maybe you're newish to church. I believe the greatest decision that you, decision that you can make is to get planted in the house of God. Give God a year. Get immersed in relationships and you'll see amazing things begin to happen.